Okay, welcome everyone. Um, we're so happy to have Jessica and Trina Quinn here and bring us some holiday spirit uh, as we come closer to the holidays. And we're so thankful to have them here to teach us how to bake um, with Ukrainian heritage. We're so excited. Just some ground rules, please keep your mics muted and your cameras off. You can keep your camera on, but keep your mics muted the whole time. Also, we'll be doing a Q&A at the end of the program. So please type in your Q&A questions in the chat box. And I hope to get to, through everyone's questions at the end. Also, this program will be recorded and it will be sent out to all participants tomorrow with the follow-up survey and recipe as well. Uh, without further ado, we're going to hand it over to Trina and Jessica, and thank you so much. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to our kitchen. <laughs> uh, where Dacha 46 incidentally started in October of 2020. This is the kitchen where we created the concept, some of our original recipes, and our most popular dish, our plumini right on this very table. I'm Jessica, by the way. <laughs> um, I'm Trina. And uh, we created Dacha 46, uh, I mean, in uh, October, mm -hmm. um, October of 2020. And we had been furloughed from our jobs. And we just started cooking so much. And for us, it was really wonderful and therapeutic to just start cooking all the food that we really enjoyed. And a lot of that ended up being the food that Jess grew up eating. And incidentally, I had only had a fraction of it and she kind of blew my mind during COVID. I was like, what is this? What is this? And uh, it kind of just, I don't know, snowballed from there. Not to over, you know, romanticize it. Um, it was the first time in our adult lives that we had this much free time on our hands and both Trina and myself have worked in this, you know, industry in the restaurant industry for our entire adult, you know, careers. And we had this abundance of time and this ability to really play and be creative and kind of tap into my culture. Uh, and it was a beautiful thing that I got to share with Trina for the first time. And at that point, we, you know, we've been together over 10 years at this point, but so my background is Latvian Ukrainian Jewish. Um, and so we're really excited to be putting on today's class and, you know, doing a little demo of our version of Rugula. Uh, a fun thing about Rugula, you know, is that I don't think that any two are alike. I think that every family, every person has different preferences, different recipes and, I think one of the beautiful things about this uh, cookie is its versatility. And it's one of the things that I think Dasha 46 really loves. And it's one of those things that we really love is that we get to really play and interact and kind of maybe change up recipes that, you know, have this connotation of being a certain way and doing something new and surprising, or at least putting our own spin on it. I mean, she says it very nicely here, but when I tell her, I was like, I don't know if people are going to like that. It's like this like rage fills. And then she's like, oh, okay. Like, it's definitely <laughs> one of those things where we're very, um, we're very compassionate and very understanding about each dish's history that we're working with. And we also really want to bring it to like our table and to your table, but we want to put our stamp on it and kind of, you know, definitely absorb the seasons and, you know, try to make people understand that, you know, Eastern European cuisine is much more exciting than I think what a lot of people view as what Eastern European cuisine is. I will also say that I am much more of a traditionalist and I have a hard time uh, evolving <laughs> and moving and kind of riffing off of recipes and I would say that Trina is much more adventurous and uh, it's nice because you know as most people know I bring in that like lineage of the Eastern European connection and heritage um, but I like to joke that Trina really married into this culture and this history and region uh, but she approaches things you know with a different lens and this fresh new take on things that you know 
uh, is really exciting that I wouldn't necessarily see myself. So it's kind of one of the things that I love most about getting to work with Trina and, and do Dacha 46. I mean, and I don't know, maybe some of you that live in the city have tried it, or maybe you've seen it on our Instagram, but we did our version of Shuba <laughs> and that actually took months to like, just give me the okay to do that because I chose to do smoked whitefish instead of pickled herring because I haven't found a pickled herring that I like love yet. Um, I know it exists. I just haven't had it yet. We're still working on it. We're still working on <laughs> so, it. So, you know, it's, <laughs> it kind of goes like that as far as the, um, you know, changing dishes take a long time. Um, I think that being said, we can go into a rugula recipe. Yeah. So I'll bring our bowl over here. So, uh, you know, a lot of traditionalists will say that rugula needs to have cream cheese. Uh, the joke that kind of went throughout my family was that cream cheese never stood a chance in our house and it didn't survive long enough to make it into a rugula dough because it was smeared on every bagel that you could find. Um, but I also find a part of this recipe, which if you have your recipe because you signed up for this class, ours is an all butter uh, dough. And a reason for that is there was an element of practicality to a lot of people that grew up in the former Soviet Union. And so it was the idea of sort of repurposing, which was a huge part of it. And so our recipe with all butter dough has a flakier sort of crispier texture than necessarily a standard rugula. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I prefer it. I love it. I think it's great. But so in this bowl, we have our all purpose flour, we have our sugar and we have our salt. So we're gonna just whisk it together just until all of the dries get incorporated and they're nice and even. I'm gonna be mostly watching through this part. And uh, Trina likes to pretend that she doesn't know how to <laughs> bake, but I just am convinced that she does that. So I'll do all the baking when she gets to eat it. But if she's the best at it, I don't know why I would do it. You know, that's the trick. <laughs> Uh, in the fridge, we have our already pre-grated butter. So in the recipe, we call for grated butter. Um, so it's easiest if you do it when it's either frozen or just really chilled from the fridge. So it kind of retains its structure. And all we're gonna, oh, thank you. No problem. So all we're gonna do at this point is just kind of toss gently the shredded butter in our dry flour mixture. We wanna get the butter as evenly coated in our dries and evenly dispersed. The whole thing here is to work as gently but also as quickly as possible because we want the butter and really all of the ingredients to stay as cold as possible. So when they get baked in the oven, they sort of retain their structural perseverance and also it creates just a flakier, more beautiful, crispy, crispy cookie. So at this point, all of our butter has been incorporated <laughs> like that. Do you wanna get the water out of the fridge for me? I would love to. So at this stage, you don't have to be too delicate about it, but I like to make a well in the middle of my mixture. And I pour the water essentially right into the well. And here I have the prescribed amount of cold chilled water. I pour it in little by little because you don't want to oversaturate it. And the key is really with your hands, you go in from the bottom up, gently toss it. And a good way to tell if your dough has been hydrated enough is when you squeeze your dough, it should retain its integrity. If it crumbles apart, it hasn't been hydrated enough. It's almost there, but not fully there. So at this point, I'm gonna add a little bit more water. I would offer to pour, but I'm not trusted most often with the pouring because I get a little overzealous. She is trusted. <laughs> she likes to pretend she's trusted. So at this point, the dough is coming together really nicely. Everything's coated. Everything looks really hydrated. You don't have these intense dry pockets. Everything's also still really cold. My hands are freezing at this point. So everything's temperaturally correct. And you end up with 
basically this nice solid hydrated dough. So would you get me the plastic wrap? I would love to. Okay, this is gonna seem excessive, but if you work in restaurants, this <laughs> giant uh, yeah, this plastic wrap. Yeah, this is our, our kitchen plastic wrap. Would you just yes, yes, chef, yes. Yeah. But, you know, obviously much smaller for most people. Great plastic. Yes, wonderful. wrap it. This is how you plastic wrap dough. I'm trusted with this task. And then leave it out a second. I ran front of that. <laughs> So, all right, so next step. Once the dough is plastic wrap, I like to take my rolling pin and kind of compact it. If you do this step now, you end up with this nice cohesive dough and it's easier to roll out and work with after it's had its proper chilling time in the fridge. So you don't need to be a perfectionist about it, but the thing you want to see here is that you're going to have these nice chunks of butter that are evenly dispersed throughout your dough. And that's what ends up with that really tender flaky crumb. So at this point, I have my dough is beautiful, beautifully packaged. <laughs> I don't know how to speak anymore. And at this point, it's going to go in the fridge. Um, I recommend at least 30 minutes for it to chill properly, hydrate properly. It just ends up, once again, the whole thing with getting these rugola to the stage you want it in is proper chilling and temperature control. So it's gonna go in the fridge. And incidentally, here's another one that we have coming out of the fridge. <laughs> it's, the, it's the magic of, TV, right? Um, I think it's time to, to cheers. Are we cheersing? And we hope everybody is enjoying their beverage of choice at home along while they're baking and it's, or if they're just hanging out after a long Monday. It's so, holiday season. Happy holidays. Wrap it. So as some of you know, my background is Latvian Ukrainian. My parents emigrated to the States in the early 80s. Wait, okay, this is this is gonna be a pause portion. <laughs> it's um, a story time. So we have like boxes of Jess's family photos, and they're pretty much the best things ever. Like, yeah. So, so. uh Rugula are a popular Eastern European Jewish, you know, dessert cookie. I think that. Uh, it's a misnomer that it is a cookie meant to be enjoyed really only around the holidays. Um, in my household, we enjoyed them year round. We still enjoy them year round. You know, we used to joke that Rugola were like our chocolate chip cookie. Um, I grew up in the five towns in Cedarhurst, which is a very notoriously Jewish community. Uh, and so we were very lucky that we had some really phenomenal bakeries and we had Zomics on one end and in another, we had Walls Bakery and they made some of the most beautiful, delicious rugula. And like we said earlier, one of the most beautiful and great things about rugula is their versatility, different fillings, different kinds of doughs, really any recipe where, you know, you can interpret it however you want and put your own personality in is one that I'm a fan of. And that's one of the things that I like most about these cookies. I mean, we definitely have different fillings. We are so far, as but I will say <laughs> we fought on the filling tonight, but- And why did we fight about the filling? Because I don't love prunes. And I know that's not okay to say, but- Prunes get a bad rap. <laughs> I don't think it's fair. I don't know where, you know, I, okay. I think prunes got their bad rap because prune juice is considered this very like, luxurious juice yeah yes so <laughs> it's, it's, it's like associated with nursing homes and i think that prunes need 
I don't know, maybe they need a rebranding. I, they're delicious. They're, they add a moist tenderness to cakes. They add this beautiful, like nutty floral flavor to cookies. I mean, I, I do know this about at least Jess's family. Um, we are prune advocates. They love digestion <laughs> and things that most, are good for you. And I would say so. most Eastern Europeans have this, uh, I don't know if I'd say abnormal, but like a little bit of an over obsession with digestion. And so, yes, if you can eat a cookie and be regular, I don't really see a problem with that. Wow. This, yeah, is, this is how we're going to advertise our cookies. Uh, Listen, maybe that could be the new thing. Wow. But as Trina, why don't oh, you go no, ahead? No, no, let me do the photos. All right, you do I, got, photos. I got the photos. Which one do you want? I don't know. Whichever one you want. I mean, we, we have to show the background in order to for everybody to understand exactly where Dacha started. And I think we should start with the original, which is hopefully, yeah, I think hopefully everybody see can see. I'm just gonna put our faces right out. there. I think you can see her. Who is she? So that is my maternal grandmother. She's Baba Uh She, like everyone on my mother's side, uh, came from Riga, which is the capital of Latvia. She was a phenomenal baker and cook. Um, my mother was not. And so I like to think that uh, whatever natural baking genes I got were inherited from her. Um, I mean, speaking of the, the ultimate matriarch, ultimate. while we're here, if uh, we might as well go into that. So I mean, my this is, yeah. mother unfortunately didn't really have a talent in the kitchen. Uh, but she did have a talent for wardrobe. <laughs> right. Let's see. I'm so, hoping. I'm hoping you get the full effect here. So those are uh, those are the parents. That is uh, Aspira and Boris in the '80s. Really, just this is where she came from. Yes, which explains a lot. And on that note, we're going to go <laughs> back to the dough. So we have our dough that's been sitting in the fridge. It's nice and hydrated. We're gonna pretty liberally flour whatever surface we're working on and you're going to take your dough I like to flour a little on the bottom a little bit on top and we're going to have our rolling pin and for this one so this batch makes actually six, 16 cookies there's going to be an amendment made but so the the recipe actually only makes one batch of dough. I think in the directions it said that it was going to be divided into two different batches and it yielded 32. Um, so it actually makes one dough. So you won't be cutting it in half or anything like that. And it makes 16 cookies. And at this point, you're just kind of working from the middle out and you're going to kind of turn it to make sure it's not sticking. And you want to roll it out into... I'd say a 13 or 14 inch, you know, shape. It doesn't have to be a circle because you're going to cut it into a circle. So it doesn't really matter at this point. You don't need to be precise about it. One of the things I like about this cookie is it's not the most temperamental, but it is quite enjoyable. So you're just going to keep working it slowly. If you see that your dough is sticking, don't be afraid to flour it. It really honestly can handle it. And so you're going to just roll it. You're doing great. It looks beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. It's a great dough, everybody. It's funny because I feel like the holiday season really snuck up on us a little faster than was anticipated. Uh, I mean, for anyone who celebrates, Hanukkah started on the same weekend that Thanksgiving did. And I mean, we're less than two weeks out from Christmas. So I feel like everything's just really flying by. And so we haven't really been making all the cookies we normally do. It's true. So we're very excited to have everyone here and making one of our favorite holiday cookies that also we would like to say makes a great addition to your Christmas table as well. It is actually funny. Um, when I met Jess, I think it was what, like, so it's obviously like over 10 years at this point. Over 10 years. I had never had rugula before I met her. But you which, knew what it was. Not right? really, like I, I don't think I really did. But uh, yeah, I had never had Rugula until I met her. 
so, but I was from upstate New York, um, very upstate New York, the Finger Lakes. So that wasn't a really plentiful item there, unfortunately. And how do you feel about it now? I love it. I even love the prunes. <laughs> you heard it here. She <laughs> likes the prunes. So we have our dough rolled out to a good shape. You can use whatever you have on hand. It doesn't matter. You can use a plate. You can use a, you know, a cake dish, but we have a 12 inch cake round that we're going to use just as a guide for when we trim it. So we're just using a knife to go around. Um, sorry to interrupt, but we have a question about specifically the dough from Carly and Adele. They asked if we already split our dough in half, how big should we roll it out? Um, you can roll it out to maybe I'd say eight or 10. And then instead of slicing it into the prescribed 16, you can slice it just into eight. Okay. So we've trimmed our circle and we're going to get rid of the excess. And so here is another thing. Don't get rid of your excess dough. We have a stash of excess dough from trimmings that we keep in our fridge and it can be repurposed for multiple different items. We have used it for, well, so like late night pizza rolls, but <laughs> You know, it's like there's uh, a time and a place listen, sometimes. Pigs in a blanket. Eddie, uh, perfect. There it, okay, so growing up, it was an institution that we used to love to go to, but City Bakery, City Bakery, for anyone that knows, was in Flatiron. It was around for, I don't know, it feels like forever. They're known for their hot chocolate, but uh, a family favorite for us was they had a baker's muffin, and it was this... Uh, I, I don't know how to even describe it. It was like this muffiny croissant Danish concoction that was baked in a muffin pan. And it had uh, raisins and walnuts and a dusting of powdered sugar. If you take your leftover scraps and you roll it into balls that you then roll in cinnamon sugar and just put together in a muffin pan, you can get this weird hybrid that no one's gonna be upset about, I promise. So anyway, we have our beautiful circle of dough at this point. And Trina, what do we have? <laughs> so uh, we preserve a lot of stuff in our very tiny apartment. And uh, this year we managed to actually preserve a lot of stone fruit. So these are some uh, really wonderful apricots we got from uh, my family in upstate. Yes, so we are very fortunate to have a lot of access to really beautiful produce. And um, I would say that Trina, is not obsessed with preserving, but has a strong fondness for it. Am I right in saying that? I mean, <laughs> why wouldn't you love a ball jar? You know, I mean, we have so many of them, you can use them whenever. So it's also nice because it is winter time, it's really dark out, there feels like there's no sunshine left in the world. And when you bite into the rucola, you have this really beautiful sort of pop of summer with these nice like floral and tart apricot marmalade that we kind of include in this recipe. So very liberally just spread whatever jam you want, whatever preserve you want. There's really no rhyme or reason, do whatever you want. It's like a free for all with this recipe. And you just wanna leave a little border on just the very outside of your dough. Which I learned. So you got that spread out. Uh, Nutella is amazing. <laughs> I'm with that. She loves Nutella. I do. I will eat it by the spoonful. We can't actually have it in this home. So after you have whatever preserved jam you want, we have just some cinnamon sugar and we are going to very generously just lay it out on top of your jam. Um, we're obsessed with cinnamon sugar in this household. And so when I say liberally, I mean, you know, good amount. So at this point, you have your foundation. Before you go ahead and put your toppings, one of the secrets that I learned in my family was to have maybe more cohesive and even cookies is that 
at this point, I cut out all of the shapes before I put on all my toppings so they don't really interfere. So you get a more sort of even cut and more even cookies across the board. So the easiest way to do that is you're gonna first cut your circle into quarters. And then you're gonna take those quarters and cut them all in half. So you end up with eight slices the way you would with like a pizza. It's been a long day. It was like, you had to take a minute to remember. <laughs> I would just eat that. Yeah, I know you would. <laughs> and then to get the 16, you're going to then cut your eights all in half. See, I think you pretend that you don't know how to bake because you just don't want to do it. I've never baked in my entire life. That's not true. I've seen it. You've made cornbread. Okay, now you're just insulting me. I'm lying. I do bake, but I leave the pastry for the most part to Jess. Okay, so at this point, they're all kind of sliced up. I always forget one. This last one. Got it all. So for the people that ended up splitting their dough, it would be eight pieces at this point. At this point, eight. And just a smaller circle. It's not really detrimental. Your final product will still come out great. Just you might either end up with something smaller, or, you know, just less up, which is totally fine. So at this point, everything's sliced. You're just gonna kind of sandwich it all back together. And so for our toppings, I'm a huge fan of toasted nuts. I love toasted walnuts. And so we're gonna just kind of take our walnuts. And once again, liberally just kind of spread it over the jammy sugar bits. Okay, give me the prunes. <laughs> All right, so I can do this. Here's the, the prunes get very sticky after you chop them up. Ooh, they still are. They're very sticky. So you're just gonna wanna kinda, <laughs> one of the tricks to get them a little less sticky is we toss them in a little bit of uh, confectioner sugar, but you're just gonna wanna separate them. Maybe and we should both do this. Oh, you wanna do it together? I think we should do it together. <laughs> So you're going to just want to kind of separate them apart and you don't want to bombard it with filling because you still want it to have this nice tight structural and you want it to be nice and round. But I like a lot of filling. So what do I, what do I know? <laughs> I told you they're sticky. I'm so good at this. You are good at this. Wow. They're very sticky. Wow. Watch out Soviet cakes. <laughs> okay. So, and then the next thing, which you can do, is you want to kind of press it down into the dough. Oh man, the heat is on. It is very sticky. It's sticky. Do, do, do. They look good. I think you can do that. Okay. Yeah, they look great. great. It's beautiful. <laughs> so at this point, oh I personally find this the most fun of making these rubble. Do you want to do it with me? I love rolling the rugies. The, oh, the rugies. I know yes, the rugies. Whatever I you want to call them. So all you're going to do to assemble them is working from the outside in is, and I like to pinch it and stretch it out a little bit, almost the way you would with a croissant. So it has a little bit more of a runway, if you will. You're going to tightly wrap it and working from the outside, working in, you're just gonna gently roll it up. Ooh, seems like uh, you got a lot of filling in that I one. I have a lot of filling and I'm not upset about it. And I feel very good about this one. Ooh, nice spiral. I'm the pastry so chef actually, now. At this point, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring over our sheet pan. Here's Jessica's, just for the record, because this is being recorded. This is not a competition. <laughs> and I have clearly much more filling. So we're gonna keep doing it and working from the outside going in. And so that's the thing. We talk about it all the time, but the idea that everything needs to be the same and it doesn't change, you know, there's not a lot of room for, for growth and creativity and for really personal identity 
if and how uh, are we putting these on the tray you know just spaced a little bit apart okay they don't you know they don't go too crazy do we put the the fold down fold has to be down by the way okay. you want to keep the seam side down and that way as it bakes it doesn't unravel and it keeps this nice tight spiral but we talk about all the different fillings obviously this one is a very particular kind of filling with the apricot preserves and the prunes but for me it's all about nostalgia um, this is one of those recipes that for me, I really feel like it represents Eastern European culture and it really represents my upbringing and growing up and really just kind of the food of my childhood. And I think that the fun thing with Dacha is it's sort of this reimagination that really I think you lend to it. I mean, we definitely have fun. Like we always joke around that it's like, you know, I grew up with like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches in my lunchbox and you grew up with what? Pickled herring. Well, I grew up with like butter and caviar on Baradinsky bread, <laughs> um, which we're not, once again, we're not competing with each other, but if we're talking PBJ versus, you know, butter and caviar, I don't know. I mean, maybe they could have like had a little bit of both. Could have been know? friends, right? A little yeah. half and half, you know. Could have shared a sandwich. A little bit of everything. <laughs> I understand it's it's definitely a messier project uh, with more filling, but I would wager that the final product is more delicious. Who's gonna we're not us? we're nothing if not extravagant. I <laughs> it's all about excess. I think that a lot of Eastern European families, uh, especially first generation like myself, That's we true. would hear stories of sort of the frugality and the rationing of growing up in the Soviet Union. And I think that, you know, we always talk about the American dream and the American dream for a lot of, you know, former Soviet families and Jewish families that had escaped all this persecution was to have this very beautiful you know, full and abundant life. And so a lot of that I feel like translates in our food and it's, sometimes it is, it's a little bit about excess and it's about abundance and it's about celebration. And I think that that's definitely one of the pillars of Dasha. It's one of my favorite things that I feel like is the ethos of who we are and what we stand for. I mean, we celebrate anything. Like you had a great day, <laughs> let's, let's have a party. Like you listen it's the good and it's the bad <laughs> you had a bad day let's have a party <laughs> let's cook food so at this point we're gonna do just a quick little cleanup <laughs> uh, well, here i got some jam we'll show everybody what yeah, we did they're show little spaced little. out you know i think we so at this point in the recipe uh you're gonna just chill them for about five minutes if you want to pop them in the fridge i don't know if this is gonna fit i can make it fit all right she's trying i got it you who going cleans in. up the extra filling we like to use our pastry scraper for all of this extra filling project and so, then, there we go wow okay so close it felt like it fit all right i'll take care of that i'm in wonderful great So hopefully at this point, everybody's having fun. We're all drinking our beverages of choice. Um, we're not boring you to death. Uh, I think we're rather exciting. So while those are chilling, uh, everyone should have their ovens preheating to 400 degrees if you don't already. Um, the, the key, once again, always, it's about temperature. Since it's an all butter crust, you want every stage of the process to stay as chilled as you can, just so when it bakes, the butter evaporates, creating these beautiful air pockets. And that's what's gonna create that really gorgeous flakiness that we're trying to achieve. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know a little background about us and sort of the, the things that we've been working on and planning, uh, we are just coming off of successfully funding our Kickstarter, which if any of you kindly donated, thank you. <laughs> um, we have a very long way to go still as far as preparation and planning. Um, but right now we got some kind of cool stuff in the works. Uh, we did a holiday pre-order. Um, our friends over at Aggies, also a 
Eastern European. Yes, and if you don't know Jeremy of Augie's Counter, um, he has been an immeasurable resource and friend to us. Uh, and he recently opened his uh, Hungarian uh, Jewish cafe restaurant in Crown Heights, and we couldn't be bigger fans of his. And uh, so he allowed us to use his space to do pickups for our holiday pre-orders. Um, and right now what we're doing is we're still working out of our friend's kitchens because they are so sweet. And we're very lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Eric. <laughs> Ursula. Um, and so we are currently selling our Pomi right now at Poppy's in Brooklyn, which is at 243 DeGrasse Street. Uh, we're selling bags of frozen Pomani and hopefully soon a couple other places. Uh, and what else we're doing? We have some really cool pop-up collaborations that are happening over the winter. Yes, we can't talk about them just yet, but very, very shortly, we will be announcing a few sit-down dinners and collaborations that we have to get us through this long, long winter. And listen, if comfort food is not what you're craving, then I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> and uh, along with that, we are still looking for a kitchen. It's very difficult, um, but we are so much closer. <laughs> uh, we were really close to a couple and then they just disappeared. Well, here's the fun thing about working in this industry. Nothing's guaranteed. I think that's a very valuable lesson that I think we have learned throughout this process and a lot of our friends have learned. Um, you might think that you have everything fully planned out and you're ready to go and things just don't go according to plan. And that's sort of just what you sign up for. And it's kind of just <laughs> being open to go with it. It's an adventure, really. It is uh, an adventure. Know, yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so that's where we're at right now. Um, but definitely go to dacha46.com. That's our website. But all our most up-to-date updates are always on our Instagram just because it's easier for us because we're both not great at technology mm. and it's just the two of us doing everything from like you know all the luxurious taxation and paperwork behind the scenes to like listen it's very glamorous to be in this industry I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what an illusion anyone's operating under but no we we do we do what we do because we love it um, one of the things that we really saw happening when we first started Dasha 46 was we, we really saw the, the idea of community in action, um, which I don't necessarily think the restaurant industry had ever seen in such a visceral and transformative way before. Um, you know, during COVID, I think there was this idea of really rallying and getting together. Uh, and if it wasn't for our community and colleagues and peers, you know, we wouldn't be where we were and where we are today. But one of those things really was, I think, about, you know, visibility and about being Eastern European, Jewish, queer, and part of this community and existing and really seeing all these people show up and feel like they had found this commonality and a place to belong and a place to feel welcome. It is true. You definitely like when we first started doing this, like it was really awesome to see when we were doing it from our apartment. And so we were running down orders, uh, just seeing Jess come back up and she was I mean, like, oh my cried. God, she's like, there's other people that are like me and they're Eastern European. And it sounds crazy. Like I thought it was, I, I thought it was insane. <laughs> and I was like, of course there's people like you. And she like literally has not seen And, and here's the thing. The, the, the thing is that on a rational uh, level, you know that you're not the only, you know, person of any kind and anywhere in the world, but I think it's very easy to feel isolated and to feel alone. And then the moment that you realize that you're not alone, and not only are you not alone, but you're being embraced and welcomed and celebrated, and it's reciprocated. It's this very sort of symbiotic relationship. I think that really was sort of the steam that we needed to keep Dacha going and evolving. And I think that that's really the reason we are where we are. It's true. If, uh, you know, if people didn't keep showing up and still didn't show <laughs> up, uh, we couldn't do this. And we really hope we can still continue doing this. So 
I hope that you keep showing up and, you know, we're going to do our best to give you as much dacha as we can and hopefully get that kitchen so we can give you more, so much more. dacha. <laughs> All right. And on that note, we're chilled. We're good. We're, we're chilled. chilled. We're chilled. And we're coming out. All right. So I do think this is bad. That's okay. Out of the fridge. You're gonna have your chilled rugula. You're gonna. I, I have this part left. You got you know, this? Yeah, I help. Go for it. I'm helping. So, at this point, what you're gonna wanna do is we have our egg wash, which really is just one egg beaten with a little bit of cold water. And you're gonna very nicely, pretty liberally brush your dough on the outside. And this is what's gonna create that nice, beautiful golden exterior. 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 It's okay. As uh, as they bake. Even and being around people virtually is very nerve wracking. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> at this point, the only person I talk to is Trina. So and they're cats sometimes, but not often. They don't need to know about the cats. Um, I'm gonna put the sugar on perhaps. Yeah, so after the egg wash, what you're gonna wanna do, and once again, very generously, cause excess, I like excess, is you want to very more, more turbinado sugar. Turbinado wow, sugar I, is I your friend. Beautiful. That's too much. Yeah, that's good, that's no? good. All right. I want that nice, crispy, crunchy sugar crust on the outside. And it's one of my, yeah, I'm talking with my hands. So one of my favorite parts of these cookies that crust is addictive and it does create this beautiful caramelization. You get this gorgeous crust. It's sweet and it has that nutty and jam sticky filling. See, that's a good sprinkle. What sounds? <laughs> it's beautiful. So, you're gonna just keep doing this once all of them are fully coated, which they look like they are. So much sugar. <laughs> Beautiful, done. Good job, Trina. Thank you. At this point, you have very nicely sugared and egg wash rugula. They're gonna go into your 400 degree preheated oven for about 20 to 25 minutes. And because the magic of TV teaches us how to do this, we have already a batch that's baked off. And so the final product is like this. So like I said, all of that temperature control creates this beautiful sort of crisp, beautifully golden brown on the outside exterior. And flaky, like so flaky, like the entire thing. I've eaten so many today though. Do you want another bite? <laughs> I'm going in. Okay. They're terrible. Don't make these. They're delicious. Even with the prunes, shockingly so. So not bad. I love them. Good job. Thank you. Those look wonderful. Um, they look so yummy. Um, and the magic of TV, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> We've learned a lot from Ina. Right, right. <laughs> um, so there you have it. Uh, thank you so much. Um, is, are there, so we have time for Q&A. Um, um, does anyone have any questions they want to put in the chat box so I can read them off? Um, any comments rather, if you have anything to say, that would be great. Um, I'll just give people a moment to type in their questions or comments. Yeah, they can think their thoughts. In the meantime, I do want to plug in uh, some MoFAD um, events. Um, this Thursday, we're having an event at the Ace Hotel in Brooklyn. Um, please go onto our website for mofad.org for more information about that and our upcoming events. Also, um, please tell everyone that our new exhibit will be opening February 2nd, 2022 at the Africa Center. The African slash American table will be opening finally. 
I know we were planning to open <laughs> in 2020, but we all know what happened. Yeah. And so, um, please tell everyone, come out, please. It's gonna be a, it's a wonderful exhibit. Um, it's it's so, has so much buzz, um, so much press. It's gonna be great. So please come out there. Um, we have some comments coming in from Paula. It was very fun. Thank you. Um, from Danny. Thanks for and joining, Paula. <laughs> First of all, we love Dacha and looking forward to more. My question is, what's your favorite dish you've ever created so far? <laughs> we get asked that a lot. Uh, what's yours? Don't say palmini. I'm going to be honest. I don't think it is. I think it's our poppy seed babka. Oh, that yeah. Burn. No, I, sure. <laughs> I love babka. Um, I, I feel like poppy seeds, uh, another one like prunes don't get their moment in the light. Uh, and I want to, it's a very like Ukrainian sort of staple, but, uh, we do this beautiful, like sticky, like sweet, earthy, nutty poppy seed filling in a, you know, very traditional babka dough. Um, and I really love it. And it, it feels very nostalgic and homey to me. Mine's definitely the pill name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have a comment from Jennifer. Can't wait to try the recipe. Thanks for sharing all the personal stories. Yes, it was great banter. Um, <laughs> I love the personal anecdotes you put in there. Um, you, should start a, you should start a YouTube channel. <laughs> yeah. If only we knew how to do that. If only we <laughs> knew how to use technology. <laughs> we're very old. Uh, but we're not. We just don't know how to do anything. <laughs> I understand that, I, but actually, it's not that it's not that hard as you think it is to upload a video to YouTube. You just need to follow. Listen, I'm amazed every time you can hear us when we do these. I, yes, <laughs> this was a huge accomplishment for us, so thank you for letting us do this. All right, um, we're trying to see here. Any more? Everybody's too busy with their beverages, you know. Yeah, that's <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Well, uh, we're gonna thank Jessica and Trina so much for doing this wonderful program for us getting us in the holiday spirit. Once again, all participants, you will receive a the copy of the recipe with the changes, the amendments, also a survey, a brief survey and a recording of this program as well. For those who couldn't make it or you just wanna see the program or recipe again, you'll get that recording tomorrow in an email. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, oh, we have one more question. Oh, uh, <laughs> sorry. What dish yeah, took the longest for you to come after? Sorry, what was that? What dish took the What us dish took the longest for you to master? I don't wanna sound like it's a trick, but I don't think we've mastered any dish. like. <laughs> I know it's like I don't want to sound like that but for me I think my like triumphant dish was our keepski cake it is the best it's gone through many yeah. iterations uh Trina happened to try a family recipe years ago and it's been the one that we use as like a reference point um and it took a long time and a lot of cakes were I regretfully have to admit were thrown in the trash because I was so frustrated across the room um <laughs> <laughs> but I am I'm very very happy with where we've ended on that cake so I would say for me that was that was my triumphant dish I mean yeah okay and last question what is your favorite holiday dish Ooh. Any dish I don't have to make. <laughs> <laughs> I love when other people cook for us. I think it's funny. There's a joke out there that people don't like to cook for people who are like chefs or in the industry because they're intimidated. But you could literally put yeah. a sandwich, like you put bread and butter in front of me and I would be so excited to eat it because I didn't make it. It's true. That is very true. But also Trina's mom's mac and cheese. I'm going to say I mean, that it, it's not really a holiday, but we always tend to eat it over the holidays because we haven't been able to see them as much. So we're excited to actually, it's different when people cook it for you, for sure. Like we have the recipe, we've done it, but it's just something magical. Yep. 
Um, I would say as an African-American, mac and cheese is very much a holiday dish. And <laughs> yeah. it's all the time in holidays. So yes, it does count. <laughs> Listen, it, counts. It, it feels extra special. And when someone else makes it, it's extra, extra special. It's true. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Once again, you'll receive a follow-up email. Um, thank you so much, Jessica and Trina, for um, doing, doing this with us. And I hope yeah. everyone has a wonderful holiday and a wonderful evening. Yeah, thanks for joining. Thanks for having us, mystery person. <laughs> <laughs>